You are listening to Harvest Bible Chapel KL. For more information, please visit our website at www.harvestkl.org. Very good morning to everyone. As the bags continue to go round, let me just start by making some introductory remarks. Those of you who are new among us, welcome. My name is uh, Elder Larry Loon. Our senior pastor at the moment is away. He has been away for a couple of weeks. He is Pastor Nate. Uh, in fact, uh, today he is preaching at the Harvest uh, Annapolis. If you, those of you who are long with us, uh, you remember that in November 2017, the senior pastor of uh, Harvest Annapolis, Dan Hammer, uh, was here in uh, Harvest KL and helped us run a men's uh, retreat, right? And, uh, well, uh, Harvest KL here, uh, we belong to a network of uh, Harvest churches, uh, now part of that great commission uh, collective, GCC. And uh, our senior pastor Nate has been back in the U.S. for the past uh, couple of weeks to reconnect with the support base there. And uh, he will be back, uh, and you will have him preach to you next week. After this Sunday, I'm done for a while. (laughs) Um, Today, we will consider another of Jesus' miracles in uh, Mark chapter 5, uh, verse 1 to 20. Uh, and I will attempt to unpack that for you and outline. I will treat it in an outline fashion in four parts. The first part is the first five verses, one to five, where the focus is on uh, a ruined and rejected man, the man that was uh, demon-possessed. And then move on to the second part, which is about a legion of fearful demons uh, from verse 6 to 10. And the third part will be uh, a frightened group of people that uh, rejected Jesus, uh, which is a sad story. You will come to that. And the final part, which is actually the core and the focus of uh, our meditation this morning, is that uh, Jesus wants us to go and tell your story. And for each part, I will uh, attempt to make uh, one or two Lessons or observations to help us uh, understand the significance of this uh, event. Uh, okay, if we turn to Mark 5, uh, verse uh, 1 to 5 first, right? The day the disciples went across the lake to the region of uh, Gerasenes. The uh, region of Gerasenes is a Gentile uh, territory. Remember that uh, Jesus, up to now, uh, you can say had been uh, ministering. He started his ministry around the, the lake or sea of uh, Galilee and also in Jerusalem. Uh, most of them were to a uh, Jewish uh, community, right? But in this story, he took the boat and he went across the lake. Uh, last week, we consider uh, the story of how he left a crowd, a huge crowd behind. In fact, he was teaching that crowd from a boat, right? Remember? teaching them about, uh, in, in parables. And after he taught them a whole day, he told the disciples, Let go, let's us go across to the other side. And on that boat, he crossed. Of course, last week we consider uh, the lessons of the storm that the disciples went through. And here at the beginning of Mark chapter 5, it says they went across that lake to this region. This region is uh, somewhere... Uh, I do a little bit of research, and it's somewhere in the southeast portion of uh, the Lake of uh, Galilee, it's on the other side, and it's actually a Gentile territory. And this is interesting because, uh, from my uh, understanding of Scripture, this is one of the few, if any, occasion where Jesus actually went to the Gentiles, because most of his time he spent ministry. Because he says, "I came to the lost sheep of Israel." But this one, he went to the Gentile. And I will uh, elaborate this a little bit more in the sense that uh, there's quite a significant story here because he left a huge crowd of largely Jewish followers, right? And went across a lake 
to minister to this one guy. And he's a Gentile. And I think there's a huge significance there that uh, every soul is important to Jesus. Every one of us is significant in his sight. And I want to unpack for you later on that uh, what is happening to you right now, that God is de- developing and giving you that story that he wants you to have and you to go out with that story to tell the world. I'll come back to that in a little bit more. And verse 2 says, when Jesus get out of the boat, and this is the same boat that he taught the disciples on the other side of the lake, went through the storm, and he went to this uh, region of uh, Gerasim, and he stepped out of that boat. And a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. The man came to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and feet, but he torn the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue, subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Now, this is really a ruined man. Uh, he obviously had his own story. He had his family, but because of the problem he had, he now is uh, living on his own among the tombs. And I was wondering as I was preparing this, now why would Mark record this incident? If you recall in Mark chapter 3, before Mark 4 and Mark 5, there was this issue because Jesus, when he came, uh, he exhibited, or he, he taught with the wisdom that came from heaven, Right? And he did many miracles, and we learn from uh, Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians that Jesus is the power of God, and it is shown by his many works, many miracles. And Jesus is the wisdom of God, and that is shown in his teachings, the, mirac- the parables that he told, and the teachings that he had taught his disciples that is now recorded for us in the Holy Scripture. And he, when he came, he came with the wisdom of heaven, and with the power of God. And, uh, of course, the religious leader of that day, uh, well, you can say jealous because they didn't have uh, what Jesus had. And in Mark chapter 3 and verse 22, he says, the teachers of the law who were from Jerusalem came and accused Jesus. He says, you are possessed by Bazabel, the prince of demons. And because you are possessed by Bazabel, therefore you are able to drive out demons. And I think when Mark recorded this, he's more or less saying, okay, I will tell you what a demon-possessed person is like. And this is it. When you are demon-possessed, which Jesus could not be, but although he was accused, that he was, a, he was being possessed by Balsabal, which is the prince of demons. This demon-possessed man was ruined, he's hurting himself, He can't even, not talking about Jesus helping others, he can't even help himself. He was harming others, and uh, while others tried to restrain him, but they could not, right? They tried to chain him, and when when the demons were in him, he broke the chains. Imagine that, uh, the power uh, that uh, he has when the demons were in him. And he was roaming the, among the tombs, aimlessly separated from his family and friends. And in a sense, he is helpless and uh, desperate. So the question is, can this uh, they accuse Jesus of being possessed by Brazil? So can this be so? So this demon, possessed man, Jesus came and, you know, uh, tried to, uh, the man ran straight to him. And what would be a demon-possessed man 
be like. And I think Mark tells this story about this, or record this incident about this demon-possessed man uh, that is basically, you know, and you compare and contrast this uh, with who Jesus is. And in John chapter 10 and verse 10, it was recorded that the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And this is what's happening to this man. Right? Whatever life he has had, it's gone. But Jesus said in John 10 and verse 10, says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And this is the promise that God gave to each one of us. That in Christ, we can have life. Outside of him, whatever life you have is not the life that God intends you to have in this world. And Jesus left the crowd across the sea, go through the storm to meet this guy. And Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And in, in John 10 and the one after that, he says, I am the good shepherd. Four times in John uh, chapter 10, Jesus said, I lay down my life for the sheep. Four times. In verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lay down his life for the sheep. Jesus is that good shepherd. Have you found him? Do you know him? Verse 15, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep knows me. I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus cares. He cares for this one man. Because he crossed the sea through the storm to encounter this one man. And after that, he went back. And if you are that one person in your life, in life, he is hopeless in a sense, right? No cure. People tried to restrain him, they couldn't. And he lives among the tombs. But Jesus crossed that lake just to save him. Jesus cares for you, each one of us. So whatever your situation may be, however desperate it may seem, Jesus wants you. And then verse 17 of uh, John 10, it says, The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. The father loves each one of us. And verse 18, he says, No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, authority to take it up again. Right? Jesus willingly lay down his life for his sheep. So four times in this uh, thing, Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd, I lay down my life. And in verse 16 of uh, this thing, he says, I have other sheep that is not of this hand, not of this fold, referring to Israel, right? And this one guy belongs to that. He says, I must bring them also, Right? Those in the garrisons, these are the Gentile territories, all right? This is where this, uh, this uh, demon-possessed guy uh, is living. He's among the, later on in the story, we know that he's, li- he's so-called, his circle of uh, influence is among this uh, Decapolis, the ten cities on the other side of the uh, lake or the Sea of Galilee. Right? And Jesus says, I have, in, in John 10 and verse 16, he says, I have other sheep that is not of this sheep pen. This sheep pen referring to the Jews, right? And here, in this incident, Jesus deliberately, through the storm, went across uh, the lake to, to this so-called Gentile territory. Okay? And find this guy. And he says that they, they too will listen to my voice, and they shall be one... F- there shall be one flock and one shepherd. And this is what uh, you can say the good news of Jesus is about, right? He came to save not just the Jews, but in this 
in the, or when he came on his earth, his primary ministry was to the Jews. I came for the lordship of Israel, he says. But in this incident, uh, we see here that his ministry is not confined to just that. Okay? He says, I have other ship that is not of this ship pen. I must bring them also, referring to the Gentiles. And this guy is it. Okay? And you can say that uh, Jesus, when he told this story about the, that, you know, he's the, he being accused of being the possessed by Brazabel, the prince of demons, and he told, going back to uh, Mark chapter 3, he says in verse 27, he says, In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man. Jesus is that strong man. Okay? Jesus is strong enough to subdue uh, this uh, legion of demons that is uh, in this, uh, this guy that uh, he, he encountered. In 1 John chapter 8 and verse uh, uh, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8, the reason the Son of Man, Jesus, came was to destroy the devil's work. Okay? And this is what Jesus wants to do. Right? And in Hebrews uh, 2 and 14, it says, Jesus came in the flesh in human form so that by his death, by Jesus' death, he might destroy him, the devil, who holds the power of death. Right? And in a sense, this, um, this guy in uh, Gerizim was uh, under the grip of the evil one. And Jesus went there uh, to free him. And then in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12, he says, But when Jesus had offered f- for all time one sacrifice for sin, died on the cross, he, Jesus, sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he, wants, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. So in a sense, here we see that Jesus you can say he deliberately crossed the lake of uh, Galilee to find to free this uh, demon possessed man. Uh, although that was not part of his, you can say, primary uh, mission at that time, because he came to the lordship of Israel. But even then, uh, he find time to go to this to cross the lake to find this one guy, to free him, and then to set him free so that he can go and be, you can say, uh, a missionary. And later on, you find that this guy went to tell his story to uh, the, re- the, the ten cities, the region of uh, Decapolis. All right? So, in a sense here, even here you can say that this is essentially what Jesus came to do. We, each one of us have our own stories. Right? When God finds us and saves us from, you can say, our demons, whatever it is that is troubling us, He set us free. He wants us to go and be His uh, so called missionary where we are and tell His story. Okay? So, this is uh, the first part. Then let's move on to the second part in verse uh, 6 to 10. When he saw Jesus, this is this uh, demon-possessed guy, saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of Jesus. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus has said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, For we are many. So this guy is being possessed not by one demon, but by a legion of demons. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. Now that, what's interesting here is that... Uh, this, in most of the other records in the Gospels, where we 
see uh, the demon encountering Jesus. Jesus just have to say a word and this guy will be gone. Right. But this particular one was pretty stubborn, uh, refused to go, uh, and they, he, they, the thing was negotiating with, with Jesus, and then we have this, then we have this account, right? Maybe because there are many of them. He says a legion, right? Uh, well, I did some research. A legion is not one, not ten, not hundred. It's in the thousands, right? Some say it's two thousand, some say it's six thousand. But whatever it is, it's a lot of <laughs> demons, right? Even if it's one, we will be pretty uh, fearful already. In fact, most of the other records. Just one demon, Jesus, uh, Jesus said, go, and it will be gone. But this particular one, maybe they each, one, each one of the demon inside this guy probably taking their turns <laughs> uh, to negotiate with Jesus because he says in verse 10 that uh, this, the, 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 the man, the demon was speaking through the man, says again and again, tell them not to send them out of uh, the area. But, we can almost see that uh, the demons were, while they have uh, their reign uh, in, in humans, but as soon as Jesus appeared, they were, what in our colloquial language say, they put chat already. Right? They were fearful. They were scared. Why? Because the demons knew who Jesus is. The first thing he says is that Jesus, son of the most high God. They recognize who Jesus is. Right? And then in, uh, in Mark 1 and verse 23, it says, A man in the synagogue there, it says he recognized that he is the most holy one. Okay? So the demons knew who Jesus is. And then in Mark uh, 1 23, as well as later on in Acts 19, it says uh, they know who Jesus is. Okay? The demons recognize uh, Jesus' authority over them. Right? In verse 6, it says, they came and they fell on his knees in front of them. As soon as Jesus stepped out of the boat onto the shore, when this guy, this guy with, was possessed by the legion of demons, as soon as he saw he, this guy who ran to Jesus, that means in the spiritual realm, they recognize and they know who Jesus is. They recognized Jesus' authority. So verse 6 of Mark 5 says, They ran and they fell on their knees in front of Jesus. And they begged Jesus. Verse 10. Verse 7 says, They were afraid of Jesus. And they asked Jesus, Please, don't torture me. Don't torment me. In verse 10. Uh, verse 7. Right? And uh, in, verse, in, Mark, in the earlier episode in Mark 1, they says, Please don't destroy us. So they know that they, you can say their fate, because of their rebellion, they were actually fallen angels, uh, all these demons, right? One third of them were followed together with uh, Lucifer, the, the devil, Satan. They fell out of heaven and they were uh, rejected, okay? So in a sense, they know they are heading for destruction. And they, you can say they are bite, bite, biting their time, okay? So when Jesus appeared, well, some of them thought that maybe their time has come. Have you come to destroy us, he says? You know, what do you have to do with us? You know, they recognize who Jesus is. So, in this uh, episode, we can say that Mark uh, record here that Jesus, in Mark's record, there is, uh, I did some so-called research, that in the Gospel of Mark, there's recorded at least 10 times all these events or incidents about demons' possession, so to say. Okay? Uh, in the uh, Gospel of uh, Matthew, there's eight times, and in the Gospel of Luke, there's also about nine, eight, nine times. So you can say Mark record tops it all. But okay, on the average, you can say all the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, they have about eight, nine, or ten times record about uh, demon possessions. Okay? But what is interesting, and I mentioned this some time ago, that in the Gospel of John, 
there is not a single mention of any demon uh, driving events. And that sort of, sort of puzzled me, right? Why will Matthew, Mark, Luke and John record the, the many multiple events of demon possessions? And it's clear from this incident that uh, the demons were afraid. They were fearful whenever Jesus showed up. And you can say this particular incident was a bit unusual from the point of view that uh, they actually, because of the many uh, legions uh, or many demons in there, uh, they were, in a sense, stubbornly refused to come out of this man. Immediately, they were negotiating with Jesus. Right? But in John's Gospel, there was not a single mention at all. So that set me doing some uh, deeper Bible study to say, now, why was it the case? Why was John, the apostle, didn't mention anything about Jesus driving out demons in his gospel? In John 20 and verse, uh, towards the end of John's gospel, he records this uh, event, okay? Or rather, let, let, let me, before I go there, let me say that uh, John in his uh, gospel make no record of this. Uh, partly because here in Mark chapter 9 and verse 38, uh, there was this record that Sorry, I misplaced my notes here. <laughs> yeah, in Mark chapter 8, uh, it was recorded that Jesus drove a demon out, uh, a demon out of uh, John saw John saw who I call um, someone driving out demons. And John asked Jesus, should we stop them? Uh, because he's not one of us, right? But Jesus says, no, don't stop him. He's, uh, you know, he's, if he's not for us, if he's doing it, he's, he's uh, what I call doing it because uh, he's part of us. So one, you can say one possibility why John didn't record any demon driving event in his gospel because in John's view, uh, driving demon is uh, not, you can say, not special, not unique, right? Because uh, other people can do it, right? And then, um, and this is recorded in Mark 9, verse 38, that others uh, can also drive out demons. And then, of course, John himself and the other disciples with him, uh, in, even in Mark's here, Three times in Mark's Gospel, he says that Jesus gave the disciples the authority to drive up demons. So John, uh, together with all the other disciples with him, they were going around uh, proclaiming the good news of the, uh, the kingdom. And part of that, they also drive out uh, demons, right? Three times, in fact, in uh, Mark's Gospel, Mark uh, 3, Mark 6, and uh, Mark uh, 9, it is recorded that the disciples themselves went around uh, driving out uh, demons. Okay? So, and then in, um, Matt, in this, uh, what I call Matthew 7 and verse 22, this is a, a rather unique one. Uh, it's not on the slide. In Matthew 7 and verse 22, it says that even the false teachers, those who were uh, teaching false things, even they, uh, goes out driving out uh, demons, right? Because in uh, Matthew 7 and verse uh, 22, he says, uh, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, uh, did not we prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then Jesus will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers, right? So, Somehow, you can say the ability to drive out demons, uh, even those who are, you can say, not part of uh, the, uh, Jesus' disciples, they could also do it. Okay? So, at least my understanding 
is that uh, John exclusively did not record any of this in his gospel is because I think in John's understanding, this so-called ability to drive out demons, although from our human point of view is a fantastic, it's uh, demonstrate the power uh, that is available in Christ, but you can say it's not unique to Christ. Others can also do it. And John himself, in his gospel, towards the last part of his gospel, in John 20 and verse uh, 30, he says, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of the disciples which were not recorded in his gospel. Okay? But these were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that by believing you may have life in his name. So, you can say John's gospel, or John, in uh, John's estimation, or in John's understanding, uh, he wrote his gospel, he chose the many, among the many miracles, uh, works that Jesus did, he chose only selected few. In fact, if you read the record, there is only seven that John recorded. And none of it has got to do with driving out demons. Because in John's estimation, driving out demons is not unique to Christ. Other people can do it. Even the disciples themselves could do it. And even those that are outside of the circle of the disciples can do it. And even the false uh, prophets themselves right, could do it. So you can say, while it is a, a reflection of some divine power, but it is not something... Uh, that is unique to Jesus. So in John's Gospel, he, you go and uh, look into it, he recorded only seven miracles that Jesus performed. And they are very special ones. Okay? Not one of them, uh, in fact, among the seven, uh, only one of them is, you can say, repeated in the other Gospels. Otherwise, the rest of the seven is unique uh, to John's Gospel. The first one you all know. Jesus, uh, John chapter 2, Jesus changed water into wine. And then John chapter 4, where he turned, uh, he healed an uh, uh, official son with just one word, without having to say anything, just one word. And then he goes on, he heals an invalid person who has been uh, invalid for 38 years by the pool of Bethesda. Right? There people gather all the time. Okay, it's a special phenomenon where the first one who jumps into the pool will get uh, healed from whatever uh, sicknesses he gets. And this guy, one day, because he's an invalid, you know, he says, you know, every time when the spirit comes and stirs the water, somebody else gets in in front of him. So he, he has, for 38 years, he couldn't get ahead of anybody else. And then Jesus came and healed this guy, right? And then, of course, the next one is uh, when Jesus feed the uh, 5,000. Uh, this one is unique, okay? And this one is repeated in almost uh, every gospel. Uh, that is uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as well. And then only in uh, John 6, it's also recorded that Jesus walked on the water. And uh, John 9, uh, that Jesus healed a man that has been born blind, which has uh, never been heard before. And then John uh, 11, where Jesus raised... Uh, Lazarus uh, from the dead. That's quite unique, right? So all this uh, is recorded only in John. And John's purpose of uh, recording this is to show, like what it was uh, mentioned there in John chapter 21 and verse, to the last, almost the last verse of John's gospel. He says, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. So Jesus did a lot of miracles, right? I think I once did, uh, you can, or you can do a, a, a rough uh, mental calculation. He, his public ministry was three years, right? If each year is, we take in round numbers, is 300 days, right? If he did just one miracle in one day, Right? That would be 300 miracles a year, and his public ministry is three years. So you multiply that, very soon you will run into a, a figure of about a thousand odd. Okay? That's why John here is saying, you know, if I were to record everything that Jesus did, right, 
even the whole world books will not because at that time they write in scrolls, right? Not, not, in the, not in the way that we have it today. So Jesus, when he was on earth, he did many miracles, he spoke a lot. And what we have now recorded for us in the Gospels is only what uh, you can say a segment, a selected segment of what he had done. And John chose only seven, which is very unique. And he wrote this uh, to say that, uh, to convince, you can say, his readers that uh, Jesus is who he says he is. He is the Christ, the Son of God, and that uh, we should believe in him, and in believing in him, we will have life in his name. Okay? So this is just, uh, uh, you can say, a little extra on what I, I think about three weeks ago I spoke and I said that I will explain to you why there is no mention of uh, demon driving uh, by John in his gospel. And I think this is it, okay? That while it is a fantastic uh, power, ability that shows that this particular event that's recorded for us in Mark 5 is unique because it is not one demon, it is a legion of demons because there are many of them. How many in one legion? Well, according to records, a Roman legion has about 2,000. Some say 2,000, my research says some say 6,000, but whatever the number is, it is a lot, okay? And it could be because it's a lot in this one guy that when Jesus tells them to go, again and again, maybe they take turns, huh? many thousands of them take turns to negotiate. Say, hey, can we do this, can we do that? Okay? So, if you pick up the story again, it says in verse 11 of Mark uh, 5, it says, a large herd of pigs were feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission. And the evil spirit came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. So this is quite a, you can say, a unique uh, happening here. Okay? And when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been demon-possessed uh, by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed, and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Right? Imagine that this one guy who had been going around, screaming his head off, cutting himself, tormenting everybody and himself, suddenly sitting quiet next to Jesus, dressed, because before that he was running around naked, and they were afraid. Verse 16 says, those who had seen it told the people what had happened to this demon-possessed man, and told them about the pigs as well. There were about 2,000 of them. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region, right? Because they were overcome with fear. Now, this story was quite, you can say, uh, interesting, right? The legion of demons were pleading, with, they were fearful, they recognized who Jesus was, and they knew that, you know, uh, Jesus wanted them to get out of this, this man. And the record says that uh, they repeatedly begged Jesus. Basically, they were negotiating. I don't know, you know, the record doesn't tell us what they were negotiating about. Okay? But after a while, they knew that they had to leave this man because Jesus wanted to uh, tell them to get out of this man. And there were this herd of uh, pigs, 2,000 of them, uh, who were there. And they asked Jesus for permission, can we go into the pigs? You see, they cannot of themselves go, right? Jesus have to, they have to ask permission. And unless Jesus tell them yes, they couldn't move. In fact, probably if the, I were to extrapolate what they had in, in mind, they probably think that their, destru their destruction is at hand. You know? And they were so negotiating and trying to find a way out of their 
you can see their predicament. Okay? And here, you can say they saw, and Jesus gave them permission, go. And they went, and the 2,000 odd whole herd of uh, pigs ran over the, the, the cliff and, and drowned. So 2,000 pigs, herds, I suppose if you try to compute and value that, that's quite a, that's quite a sum. Probably the whole economy of that region there is probably uh, hanging on to that uh, herd that had, uh, were gazing there. And Jesus, you can say, told the demons, yeah, you go, just to save this one guy. And this brings us the value of the one guy. Right? In Matthew 16 and verse uh, 26, it says, what, what good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeit his own soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? And this, is, this, this incident highlights that in Jesus' estimation, in, in God's view, right, your soul values immensely. That's why Jesus came. That's why he died on the cross to save each one of us. Oftentimes we look at economic value of things, right? Okay? And we somehow, in our earthly estimation, we, we sort of value and prize those things more than people. We would make use of people in order to get things. But here Jesus is showing the value of one guy. He would rather destroy the whole herd of 2,000 pigs, destroy almost, I don't know, a large part of the economy at that time, just to save that one guy. And he asked the question, what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Think about that. You value your value in God's eyes is immense. Okay? And in Matthew 10 and verse 28, it says, Do not be afraid of those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can kill both body and soul in hell. Okay? And I think this is the story here, the lessons here. All right? So whatever may be your situation this morning, uh, you could be like this demon-possessed guy, robbed of his everything. There's no hope for him. Right? His family abandoned him. There's no hope for him in this world. Jesus, you can say, crossed that lake through the storm and to encounter this one guy. Because after he encountered this one guy, he went back. There's nobody, nothing else for him there. So you can say from our hindsight, we know that Jesus crossed that lake just for this one guy. So whatever may be your desperate situation today, you are no worse than this one guy. Okay? And Jesus wants to help you and save you the same way as he did to this man. Okay? So he says, do not be afraid. So, the question before you and before us today is, what will you do with Jesus? Will you ask Jesus to leave you alone? Will you reject Jesus? Or will you accept him? Will you ask Jesus to help you overcome your fears, your demons, whatever it may be? And this is, you can say, if you, took, if you take nothing from what I've said, the whole morning, remember this. That Jesus crossed that lake through the storm just to encounter this one guy. Okay? This one guy that the world has already written off. He's living among the tombs. They try to chain him, but he breaks them all. He's condemned. They're just waiting for him, for him to die. And that's it. And he is not even belonging to the, the nation of Israel. He's a Gentile, for all we know. Right? Yet Jesus came to look for this one guy. 
And I put it to you today that Jesus came all the way from heaven to earth. If you are the only one that needs to be saved. We can now come to the last part. It says in verse 18 of uh, Matthew 5, as Jesus was getting into the boat, so this guy was already, you know, delivered, and in his mind, Jesus, the, the crowd, the people there, you know, find Jesus threatening, you know, he already ruined my, uh, my herd of uh, cattle into the sea. He says, please. They were afraid of him. He says, please go. So Jesus was getting into the boat. The man who had been demon-possessed begged him to go with him. Of course you would, isn't it? Right? He has been saved from his uh, so-called tragedy, his disaster. And here was the guy, Jesus, who has redeemed him and was living. And he wants to go with Jesus. Beg to go with Jesus. And verse 19 says, Jesus did not let him but said, Go home to your family, and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how much he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis, that means the ten cities around that region, how much Jesus has done for him. And all the people were amazed. So Jesus wants us to go and tell our story. Okay? How much Jesus has done for you, your testimony. Jesus did not save us so that we can just huddle among ourselves on Sunday morning or in our small groups fellowship, have a good time, and that's it. No. While we need to do that, the purpose of doing that is so that our faith may be built up, so that we may be encouraged one another, so that we can go out and do the mission that God has commissioned us to do. Jesus wants us to go and be his witness, to go and tell how much Jesus has done for us, for us and how much Jesus has mercy on us. That's the gospel that Jesus Christ has come. And the people were amazed, right? What uh, by what God has uh, done to this, uh, to this one guy. Okay? And you can see the application for us here is that uh, we need to glorify God. We need to ask God for, you can say, fresh encounters in our life that we ourselves will be amazed so that we can go out and tell our stories. That needs to get out there. All right? Jesus did not save us there just to put us in our church here for us to gather together in our holy huddle every Sunday and in our small groups and that's it. No. That's not the purpose of why Jesus came. He came to give us, to save us and to give us a story. And he wants us to get out there with our story to tell them to the world. In Acts uh, 26, Jesus told the Paul, says that I tell Paul, the apostle at that time, he says, I save you, I rescue you from your own people, from the Gentiles. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That's why you and I are saved. Right? While we need to fellowship, while we need to uh, encourage one another in our faith, we need to do that. But that's not the end all. The end all is for us to go out there so that as our eyes have been opened, we need to open the eyes of the others who are still blind and in need of Jesus. And we don't need to fear the evil one or demons because in 1 John 4 and verse 4, it was said that uh, we are God's children from God and we have overcome them because the one who is in us or in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Okay? 
So you can say that uh, wherever we are, Jesus now lives in each one of us. And when we go, he go with us. And he who is in us is greater than he is in the world. So when we go and confront, you can say, the world in their desperation, in their need, right? we need to fear no evil because God is with us. And in 1 John 5 and verse 18 says, We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who has been born of God, that is Jesus, keep us safe and the evil one cannot harm him or harm us. Right? So as we go, we may encounter evil along the way, right? But we have no fear because we go in the name of Jesus and he is with us. And in some ways, you can say that, uh, you know, numbers uh, is on our side, so to say. Okay? Uh, we did not fear the uh, legions of. Uh, uh, demons out there. Because in Matthew 26, it says in the Garden of uh, Gethsemane, when uh, they came to, you can say, grab Jesus, and Peter, of course, thought that he needed to defend Jesus through his sword and wanted to fight those who were coming to uh, grab Jesus. And Jesus told him, says, don't you think that I can call on my father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. Right? So, in, in some ways, you can say that uh, you can say numbers is on our side. We need, we need not fear any demons, okay, because uh, we have God with us. And let me just uh, close with this uh, additional, uh, you can say, episode that is recorded for us in. Uh, 2 Kings and verse uh, chapter 6, you know, where Elijah and his servant, uh, when, you know, they were being uh, so-called surrounded by <clears throat> those that came to capture Elijah, okay? In 2 Kings 6, when the king of Aden, the Ben-Hadad, who was the warring with the king of Israel at that time, uh, Joram, uh, they came and Elijah warned Joram that, uh, you know, basically tell Joram everything that the enemy, ben was trying to do. So ben who was trying to, uh, you can say, invade the nation of Israel at that time, sent a huge army of horses and chariots, a strong force by night to surround the city to, in order to capture this Elisha who was, you know, telling the king of Israel what, uh, what's, what's happening. And Elijah basically, uh, the servant of Elijah basically saw all this, uh, that he's being surrounded by the uh, opposing armies, were uh, panicked and cried out to Elijah. He says, oh Lord, what shall we do? And then Elijah calmly says, don't be afraid. All right? He says, those who are with us is more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed that the Lord will open his eyes so that he may see. And the Lord actually opened the eyes of the, the servant so that he can see the many uh, that were surrounding Elijah and the servant that were full of horses and chariots of uh, fire. Okay. And it's recorded here basically that uh, we need our eyes to be open to see that those, are, those that are with us is more than those that are against us. And in Psalm 68 and verse 17, it says, The chariots of God are tens of thousands and thousands of thousands. If you were to take that mathematically, it means that it is in the millions. All right? So you can say we are on the victory side. We are on the stronger side. Okay? And there is no, we need not fear any evil, because we are here in the power of God to do His will. We are to go and tell the nations of what they need to hear.
to be saved. So, in the closing song, let us sing this. It says, Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, and I want to see you. And I pray that indeed our eyes will be open to see God high and lifted up, shining in all his glory. And I pray that this will be true for us, that indeed his power will be poured out in us so that we may be able to sing uh, of God's holiness. Uh, Before we sing, let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this amazing story of how you traveled across the sea just to save this one guy and commissioned him to go and tell the story to many others. And which he did. Probably those many in the ten cities came to hear of your wonderful love because of him. And we pray, Lord, that indeed you too open our eyes that we may see and go and tell others of your wonderful story. In Jesus' name.